So um, Eileen, it's 11 years now since you posted the goal that Stephanie Roach scored, the Wonder Goal. Since then, it feels like everything has changed, well changed uh, in a, a lot anyway. We're seeing women's football on TV all the time. We've been to a World Cup. The Ireland team are playing in the Aviva Stadium. Can you believe how far things have come? Well, no, is the short answer that you would envis envisage, you know, that we'd be playing in the Aviva Stadium. I mean, yeah, would you dream about it? Yeah, for sure. But did you think it would become a reality? Probably, if you're being honest, no. But yeah, the growth we've seen throughout the years from, you know, standing on the sideline at amateur games to, you know, a handful of supporters at international games now to potentially selling out um, the Aviva um, for a game against England. I mean, it's incredible. It really is, and with you standing on the sideline as well, which is brilliant. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your journey into coaching. Yeah, so I suppose I was always into sport, I all brothers, so you're always playing with a ball out the backyard, and then there wasn't a girls team in my area when I was growing up, so you had to go outside to play. Um, so I started off playing in the civil service, and then ended up actually on a, a false course, um, a coaching course uh, with gap between going to college and, and finishing the leaving cert and started into my coaching journey on that that program um, and yeah just kind of went from there um, from playing into the coaching and it was kind of you know maybe it's because I was a better coach than a better player but yeah so it, was, it felt really natural um, and went from there Bodyman you know James Gate, P Mount and just here I am now yeah, you make it yeah. sound very easy. I'm sure well, there was well, plenty of challenges along the way. Yeah. So, like, tell me a little bit about that. Like, was there opportunities given to you at every turn or did you have to fight for them? Yeah, I don't think anything was given. Um, you know, it was always, always the only female on the, on the coach, coach education programmes. That was fine for me. Everybody was supportive within that environment. Um, but, yeah, you had to work extra hard to get onto the course. You had to... You know, it was always a point you were the only female. Um, yeah, and you had to prove yourself double in a way. Um, of course, I was completely committed to the to the women's game. Um, but yeah, challenges, you know, that you'll hear across the board from women around perceptions of female coaches, perceptions of the women's game within clubs. And it was a growing, it, it, as you said, and you mentioned earlier, it was a growing sport. So you had to, you had to push for a lot of... Um, basic resources for the women's team and then uh, as a coach um, you know anything I've done has been self-funded um, so what well, I started off on that the force program then it was the A license then it was the pro license then the educational aspect I mean I would have self-funded all of those programs and yeah because I wanted to be as good as I could be um, with the team and for the players so yeah it's definitely not giving um, but I think in the challenges that you have, you have to become resourceful. So I didn't do it on my own. There was a lot of good people around as well um, that, you know, were true um, supporters and true advocates for women's football as well. And, you know, they're still in the game today and that's what's helped the game grow and it's what's helped me grow um, as a coach and as a person then and as someone that is within women's football. The perception used to be, I don't think it's anymore, that if you were a successful coach that you had to go into the men's game to prove that yeah was there was there were you ever tempted or was it always the women's game no it was always the women's game and yeah I mean I've heard many female coaches ask you know oh, do you want to you know who are in senior positions of women's game and asked oh you might step into a junior position in the men's game and it's as if it's a promotion you know that you're going into the men's game but I never had any any um you know, desires to go into the to the men's game. It was always about trying to raise the standards um, in the women's game, and was totally committed to the women's game. So all of my experience then is in the women's game um, by choice. Um, so yeah, I've always been a strong supporter of the women's game, and had, that was really where my core interests are and still are. It's amazing, really, when you think that when you were starting out, Eileen, you probably couldn't see that pathway to where you are now but you you kept going and going and it sounds like it nearly opened up in front of you yeah and I think when, when you're in it you're just day to day and you're you, whether you're with that team you're you're working with them are you thinking about your 10-year plan probably not even if people are you know asking you I don't know about that questions but but 
Yeah, but I always knew when I was finished one piece of education development you wanted to do I was always curious and wanted to, to keep doing more. I think if you look at my experience or my profile, it's all essentially in Irish football. And people would always ask me along the way, why don't you go off to the US? Why don't you go off here? But I wanted to develop Irish football and had a real commitment to Irish football. And I remember someone saying to me before about my CV, I oh, didn't, you didn't show much ambition. <laughs> and that was because I was in Irish football. And I, I had to, you know, stop before I answered it. And I said, oh, maybe you should reframe that as a loyalty and a commitment to Irish football. And okay, the infrastructures need to develop. We all know that we need more resources. We need to build capacity, but it doesn't mean you're any lesser of a coach. Um, it doesn't mean that the qualifications I pursued are any lesser or, you know, it's, it's a commitment to Irish football and I think I always felt that and so here I am now. You must have seen a lot of potential there though to keep so loyal to it. Yeah, yeah, you'd see, you'd see the, the, you know, you'd see the progressions, you'd see the level of work that the clubs do, the volunteers do, the, play, the efforts that players put in at, you know, and the demands that was on them as a, as a, an amateur setup, and you know, as a, as a, a growing infrastructure, which is still growing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, the Champions League with P. Mount United. I mean, no, no one thought we were going to qualify out of a group, but us included. I mean, we were greener than the grass, and we went, and then we had to play PSG in the, the, the knockout round, and. Were they better than us? Yeah, they were better than us, but they didn't. The differences were fitnesses in the last 15, 20 minutes. So you could always see the potential there and the potential that the players had. And you would always hope for a better wraparound infrastructure and better resources that you could develop the players more. And then you could really show, you know, if we added those, where could we compete? So, yes, it's a lot to do with the domestic game. and that's progression and we've got some professionalisation, we've got the League of Ireland. Um, and then you can, I think we're really starting to see the progression at international level. Um, and yes, other countries are growing and the, the, the game has grown exponentially on a global basis. But I think you're seeing air growth now. And I mean, we're seeing it now, we're League A, we see different challenges, but we're, we're going in there with the absolute aim to compete. And I think, yeah, so, when you're in it, you're hoping for that growth, you see the potential and you're hoping that everything else can move along with it to help you get there. Do you think the players still need to go away? I think I think that question is is uh, requires a very definitive answer. I think what the broader answer is, is that the players need to be playing at a particular level um, because the demands at, at international are super high. Um, and what we need to do is to develop our domestic game um, and we need to benchmark that off other professional leagues to make sure that the players that if you're playing here in Ireland that you're still reaching those outputs because to come in and play and to, to you know challenge for a place in the squad you, you need to be playing at a high level um, so what the broad answer is that we want all of our players to be you know training and playing in a professional setup and to be training at a highest level that they can um, so if they go if they need to go away to do that if we need to also bring our domestic level up at the same time that if players choose to stay here that we're still getting the same outputs you're so well placed to look at that domestic league and, and see what we can do what needs to be done is often unattainable but what can be done to try and raise the standards yeah I think, I think what, you know, the simple answer is that we need all this money and all the clubs need the money, and, but it isn't there. Mm -hmm. So what we need to be is creative and what we need to do is to help build capacity within clubs and across, across the league that um, we can get that professional environment um, within the clubs and for all the players. Um, pretend or not pretend that we don't have all this money to do it because we really don't so how are we going to do it so I think it is about 
what is professionalism? It's not just paying the players. It's having those resources within the clubs, you know, facilities that the players can train on, increasing the number of training sessions, having coaches, you know, qualified to the highest level that they need to be, having a sports scientist, having the, the performance analyst, having, um, you know, the performance coach. And, you know, we know the clubs don't have the capacity to, to buy in all those services. Um, so us as, as, as the FEI, we need to help build those capacities by, you know, having accessible um, coach development programs, placing an emphasis on, on, on female coaches and um, coaches working within the female game, making the pro license and the higher level um, licenses accessible um, for, for coaches within the female game. Um, you know, being collaborative around relationships and partnerships with third level institutions um, that can potentially place um, sports scientists, performance coaches, you know, right across all of the League of Ireland clubs. So now you're, now you're helping the clubs and you're building capacity to create that professional environment without saying here's a million euros because we, nobody has that money. And if, if we think like that, I don't think we'll ever get there, but I do think we have opportunities to be collaborative, build partnerships, and really take a holistic view to what professionalism looks like. And then, for me, that we're driving forward that we we can get a club to the next le- stage in the Champions League, and you know, drive competition, increase professionalisation and contracts, and all those conversations. But really focus on on the culture around what professionalism is within the game. We're seeing more and more female coaches being qualified coming through coach education. Do you think they're getting the opportunities though post education? Yeah, I think <laughs> this is a thing, you know, so I know I discuss this, I, I, I say it openly, you know, numbers that don't do anything in isolation for me and a pathway and First, the first step is obviously the you know a female coming in and doing and doing the course. But what's the, where's the retention and where's the progression and where's the visibility? I mean, until recently we didn't have a female head coach in the in the League of Ireland, and that visibility is huge. Um, so it's great that we provide opportunities for over three hundred women, say, in, in in coach education and on our programs. That's the first step, but. It's also super important that we use all of our resources to provide opportunity for progression, um, to, to put women and female coaches into environments where they can be challenged and where they can be supported as well and grow. Um, so if that means placing them across our national academies or, 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 ET, you know, or, or training centres, our programmes ourselves, placing them in clubs, you know, as part of your, your, your you know, there's free UEFA B's, so as part of that, that you do a placement, that you get exposure to these environments because that's what we need. And that's what, you know, young coaches need. Um, and when I say young coaches, I mean as your, as your coach and pathway. Um, yeah, you need experience in an environment. And if we want you know, elite female coaches, we have to put them into elite high performance environments and give them that exposure, the experience, the challenge and, and support and then the opportunity to stand on the sideline as the head coach. What kind of a head coach are you? What kind of a head coach am I? In terms of the players or? Yeah, you're just, how would you describe yourself as a head coach? Are you on the sideline in your suit? Are you in, the, have you got the tracksuit on in the middle of the pitch taking all the sessions? What's your I think, I, mean, I think I'm, I'm a bit of everything. So, I mean, in the first instance, I'd like to think I'm approachable and open. Um, so, um, I think, you know, with staff, and this, this, is, this is an evolution, because I think as a coach and as a person, you evolve throughout the years. So when I started off, I didn't have any staff. I had me, me, and she's still, she's still there. <laughs> and I did all the coaching, every single session, and she didn't want to coach, so she do everything else. And like we we were and still are a great a great team. Um, but as you go as you move on, um, now we've got twenty staff. So for us, we talk about this interdisciplinary team. For me, uh, people having autonomy is is a real value. 
um, I mean, I've been in environments where you weren't allowed to do anything and it's, it's soul destroying, you know, if you want to express yourself. And if we bring people in and coaching staff, technical staff, perform staff, if they've got the expertise there, then they get to, you know, show that and deliver on that. So I feel as a, as a coach or as a head coach, I'm definitely open to promoting that kind of an environment with the with the players as well. We have good open discussions. We can talk about the tactics. Um, I mean, I've got some great assistants, Emma, Reese, Colin now. So, well, yeah, let them wet, let them perform their role. Let them have autonomy in that. Not let them, but that's the environment. It is it's it's they're going to get to express themselves in their role. So, yeah, I'd like to think um, that I'm open with that. Um, that I promote that autonomy across the staff and, and with the players um, that as a coaching style and as setting up that environment that we work off a principles base that allows for freedom within, within a context so yeah I think that's I'm smiling because that was like a question on the self-reflection that you get in the coaching yeah. what kind of <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what, do you, what do you love most about coaching? yeah look I, th- I think it's the people yeah I know that sounds a bit Jeez, of course you have the game it's the excitement it's the planning and it's the organizing and trying to get all the details right and yeah but it's the people you're interacting with and look you'll have you'll have um you'll have many moments where there's clashes and but it's yeah it's trying to drive that open communication but yeah, you have to crack and you have the highs and lows and it's it's being measured in that but yeah, there's great excitement in it if something comes off and you know it works and you get the win but yeah i think it's all the planning and the detail and, and, and it really is the people that are involved in it um, i mean some of my best moments in football are not about the football they're about a player that you know got to the international team or a player came back after an injury or is, is an illness and, and they're the moments that you remember and they're, they're about people yeah have you evolved as a coach over the years Yes. Yeah, as like I said, it's super independent. Um, did everything. Everything, you know, was my decision. And everything. So I feel like now I'm much more open um, around that part of it. Um, yeah. What about the media side of it? Do you like doing that? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, li- look. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's like everything. Like, there's good days in it. There's trickier days in it. There's you know, topical conversations that people want to ask about you're not always at liberty to speak about or you don't even want to speak about. And But visibility is a super important part of, you know, I like to say that virtuous cycle of participation, performance and visibility because if we don't drive visibility, how do we grow the game? If we drive visibility, we drive participation, we get the numbers up, we get better performances, we get you know, better talent pool to choose from. So it is all interlinked, but yeah, it's a facet that, you know, is, is it, it can be fun or it can be, it can be a, a tricky moment where mm. there's a, you know, some kind of a topic that you don't want to discuss, but it's part of it. One of them I'm sure is the role of the um, head of women and girls football and the fact that it's not a permanent position. Do you think it should be? The head of women and girls football is, is a super important role I think whoever comes in has an opportunity to make their mark. Um, and uh, I know, I mean, the Federation it, are treating it as a super important role and, you know, hate your own contracts. It's not really for, for me to get mm-hmm. into those details, but I'm definitely sure that the role is, is being given its due, its due attention. Yeah. What kind of a candidate does it need? Because you have done it and you said, and everybody has said it's a super important role. Yeah. I think it needs a candidate that's strategic about what the development of the game looks like and that can see all all um all areas um that need to be addressed in order to build to build the game. Um yeah, someone with um a zoomed out view or the capacity to zoom out and to also think outside the box and really understand what the needs of the landscape here are around what the level of growth the game is at, um, what capacities clubs have. Um, and 
to understand that pathways and for girls and boys and, and men and women we need equity but it might not look exactly the same because the needs of the women's game are very different to the needs of the men's game so does the approach from Mark Adam have to be the same with in terms of the football philosophy so we've heard that the underage teams will be prepared if anyone has to step up to the senior because they're been the same principles of football are been applied. Is that the same in the women's game? Yeah, I think I think it is. I think it's that green line that you've heard Mark talking about, um, and that's a developmental line. It doesn't it doesn't mean anybody's tied to you have to play in this formation or this style. Principles are a framework that you work to. So if we're saying Oliver, you know, you fourteenth should have reached competence in certain areas mm -hmm. of the game technically that's for boys and girls you know and um, same as that goes along that that doesn't talk about a formation or a system you, we're not talking the principles allow you flexibility in your approach to each game but they also give you a framework to work on and um, you can use that for the different ages so Oliver say for example U16 should be competent across a range of these um, and understand these principles when they move into the next and the same if a, if a management or coach steps in they know if you come in at this age group this, this is where this is where the players are at and this is what it looks like within an Irish an Irish team we're going to be heading into a new campaign yeah very soon it's exciting uh, some big nations coming to town how are you feeling about it yeah I mean look it's super exciting. The draw gave us all a good, uh, well, yeah, it was an interesting day. It was, um, yeah, I think if, if you were looking at the draw, that was always t potentially, you know, what could happen? Did we want it to happen? No, realistically, did anybody else in the group want it to happen? No, it was not just us, but here's where we are. And in the camp, and we do, we do have this phrase and we have it with staff and we say, you know, it's be where your feet are. So, promote that this is where we are how we're going to approach it you know we you know the, the very first media engagement i had after the draw they're like oh at least you have the playoff <laughs> i was thinking wow like we're not going to go there now right we're we're going to talk about we're in this group and how are we going to try to compete in this group and is it a challenge absolutely but you know, if you talk to us about who our identity is, you know, the players, we have some characteristics that, that we talk about. And with different games and this group particularly, we'll emphasise some of, you know, you'll emphasise different parts of those characteristics, like hard to be. Um, and, you know, we'll be realistic within it. We're, we're, we're up against third, fourth and fifth in the world. So nobody's making excuses but nobody's going to be unrealistic um, and we we'll look to emphasize different parts of ourselves then to get us you know within the best chance within those games so yeah it's challenging it's exciting but it is where we are and we'll we'll definitely be super positive in it yeah are you looking forward to one more than another no looking <laughs> forward to no i think it's it's you know i think i said to Gar and we came out draws like we're essentially in like a, a European semi final in every game. So no, I mean of course there's different narratives around each game and yeah, so I mean we just have to approach them all super objective, um, not get drawn into kind of distractions and different narratives around particular games like if you want to talk about the English game, like it's We'll look at that as, you know, as the excitement around the Aviva Stadium, potentially selling out that and, yeah, World Cup finalists. So they'll all bring different dynamics and, yeah, but yeah, they're all equally challenging and equally exciting, I think. Did having the challenge of the Wales game, do you think that helps a little bit, kind of heading into these games? Yeah, look, yeah I mean, we'd had eight, that was our eighth game. Um, we saw different things in, in each game and they brought different challenges. The Wales game, of course, we lost. We weren't happy with the performance. The girls weren't happy with the performance. 
Um, but it was a good opportunity for, for us to learn, to learn, and as much as that's a cliche, you know, you learn when you lose, but you do see other characteristics. We did see, we, we tried players in different positions, we tried younger players, we tried players who had typically been coming off the bench as starters, so you get to see a lot, you know, and you get a lot more clarity, um, and that's super helpful, certainly going into this, the next phase, because you're in a camp at a very short time, and you've got players who are all on different loads because of different match days. So you've got some that can train for 20 minutes, some that can train for 50. And you don't get to see as much as, you know, people are outside and you don't understand that. You've got a very short time on the pitch. You've probably got one full session where you get potentially everybody together. So you make decisions and yes, we didn't have the performance that we, we wanted. We didn't think we were anywhere near it. Um, we, you know, I've said all this, and we di we didn't get the result, but we saw we saw a lot that we can use in you know preparation for this camp as well. People are obsessed with setups now, which I think is a good thing because now we know that people are actually watching women's yeah. football because they have opinions and views on yeah. the way teams set up. Yeah. Are you going to be a little bit more pragmatic now for the next uh, few yeah. months? Do you think? I think you know people are obsessed with setups, and I'm actually not. Uh, obsessed with it I, I feel like uh, we talk about uh, being adaptable and essentially what you're talking about is how you occupy the space at a given time whether so you're in a three you're in a five you're in a four where's your you know pressing line starting from and yeah we of course we'd be pragmatic we're playing three four and fifth in the world but we were always playing to what squad we had, what characteristics you have in the team, who your opposition are. It's never overly simplified. So I won't be sitting here saying we're going to play this in every single game. This is going to be our singular f formation or our system. Because if you go into it more, you can start in a four and end in a five at a point in the game. So when we played in the, in the Nations League and we were 3-5-2. But many moments in that game, when we were pressing on one side, we were a back four, you know, and when we dropped back deeper, we were a five, three, two. So there's three different systems within one setup. And I think that's the thing for us is how we occupy the space at different moments in the game. So if we're pressing on this side, what, what's the numbers back here? If you're higher up, what's the numbers here? If you're, if you're deeper, what's the numbers there? So that's what we talk about being, being adaptable. And within that, within, the game, it, it's pretty fluid. And I think that's what the game needs now. You'll hear things about shape in possession, shape out of position, shape here, shape there. So yeah, I won't be getting stuck to one formation, but more, you know, yeah, what we need to, to win the game. Is it difficult being an international coach and only having that short window to uh, get your philosophy across and for the players to understand the, how adaptable you need them to be? Yeah. It is. It's, it, it's super difficult because you've got such a limited time and they're already overloaded at their club. So you need to be super mindful of, you know, they come in straight from games. And I mean, it's so scientific now, you know, when you come in and you've got physical load and cognitive load and you've got this day that you can't do, you can't give this much information. It is super scientific. So you're pretty, you know, time constraints are, are pretty high. Um, so. And this is something we just spoke about um, as a staffing team around the concept of essentialism while we're in the camp. So doing only what we absolutely need to do in the camp and how we can maximise the time between, between camps. So that's where, that's where the development, we're looking to, to build that in, to, to develop it and to work in with the players in between the camps um, without overloading their demands at club as well. Sounds uh, complicated. Yeah. One of the good things is that the game has become more professional in all facets, but the knock-on effect of that is that everything is under the spotlight. And one of the things that's came up in the past few weeks is relationships within setups. Do you have a view on that? <laughs> Do I have a view? Um, listen, we, ha we have views on, ev on you know, everything as a, as a coach. Um, you know, do do relationships potentially, you know, change dynamics? Yet, yeah, yes, they do. But uh, they're also a feature 
Um, so you, you do have to you do have to be able to manage it. Um, you do have to have you know your boundaries within what that looks like within a team environment and you know people in relationships have to have an awareness of you know the potential impacts that that can have because in a dressing room it's a small environment there's lots of dynamics yeah um, so yeah they are a feature um, and it is just managing boundaries and behaviours around what that looks like in, in a team setting I think yeah. it sounds like you are consumed by the job yeah. that it is everything to you yeah what do you do to switch off <laughs> yeah what do i do i watch kids movies uh, <laughs> i read i try to write a bit of my phd so yeah it's uh yeah i feel like uh sometimes you can be you can be too well i can be you know have super um you know intense activities and it, it, even if it's the PhD, so it's like philosophical. But then I can easily switch into watching the kids' movies, and that's where that's where I I actually get a lot of calm. You know, if it's something just just something that you're just you don't have to engage your brain in, or you know, go out and see your family, or spend a bit of time with with your friends. But yeah, it's it is hard to 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 switch off. But you do. I think it's important that you do because if you don't step away, you can you can't see anything. Um, so, yeah, that's that's probably watching Love Island and these these things that don't take much brain power. <laughs> yeah, I want to know about the PhD, but first, what's your favorite kids movie? Oof, it's probably Shrek, you know. Probably Shrek, the first one. I did quite like Stuart Little too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could have a big list here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I feel like they're just fun, and you know, I like all the creativity and the. So, so yeah, that's kind of my little things. Yeah. What's the PhD? Decision making in football. Yeah. So from from the players' perspective, so trying to understand what kind of factors impact that that live moment. Uh, yeah. So I was nearly finished. The sooner the better. But yeah. So we call you Doctor Eileen. <laughs> Doctor Eileen. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>